Okay, in case you were wondering, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. That's where we are. That's what we do. That's what we think about. And that's certainly what we discuss on this show. And to my left, Peter Rosick, uh, spokesman of Hawaiian Electric Company. To his left, Mitch Ewan, uh, co-host here on this Hello. show. He's a regular guy on Wednesday afternoon. And on the phone, Nick Hendrickson of Eurus Energy. We are so happy to be all together. Hi, everybody. Say hello. Hello. Aloha. Hello. Thanks for having me. Okay. Mitch, can you give us the scope of this discussion? Yes, we're going to talk about the Palihua. Did I get that right? Yeah, you <laughs> did. Close. Oh, Pali Palihua. 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 Okay, so now we all got it right. Palihua, a uh, wind farm on the west side of Oahu, out in Waianae side. And uh, so we want to know all about it, uh, Nick, and uh, you know, the, uh, the good, the bad, and no ugly, please. So <laughs> let's go ahead. So, Peter, you know, this project's been around for a while. You and I have discussed it years ago. Um, and we've discussed it with Nick also. Can yeah. you give us kind of a, a precis about, you know, the history of the project? Sure. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, from Hawaiian Electric's point of view, uh, within the last couple of years, we put out a request for uh, uh, interest, and then we put out an RFP for renewable energy last year, uh, and the request was anybody interested in building a wind farm. Uh, and uh, the fact is, there is no one else interested in, in doing that. We've gotten a lot of solar projects. So uh, this project, uh, the Gill family, which owns the land and got together with the URIS, which uh, has done projects here in Hawaii and across the globe, a very well-established renewable energy company, came to us with this proposal that they put a 47, 48 megawatt uh, wind farm at this area that is above and kind of behind the Kahi power plant. And uh, since most people don't get up there, you know, you go up to the top of the ridge and then it, the land goes back kind of flat and rolling for, uh, for a fair distance. And some people have been to the camp up there, it used to be called Camp Timberline. So we negotiated with, uh, with Eurus and we came up with a power purchase agreement uh, with a very good price and very good terms as far as we're concerned. Well, we went to the commission and uh, the commission is now reviewing that that power purchase agreement. We've had some other filings uh, related to competitive bidding because there is nobody else that wants to do one uh, of these projects. And uh, from the Hawaiian Electric point of view, uh, this gives us some diversity of, of technology. Uh, you know, we have a couple of wind farms on this island up on the North Shore, but we're getting more and more solar, which is great. But uh, we'd ideally like to have as many different diverse portfolio, portfolio diverse sure. portfolio exactly so we have uh, waste to energy here we have a lot of solar and uh, we have a, a biofuel plant uh, biofuel capable plants and so forth uh, another wind farm really this is the last viable space on this island not only that but as i recall this is a very good place for wind very strong wind. Uh, it's got a very high wind capacity there. And wind, you know, solar, uh, we call it capacity factor. We take the, the, the total potential and then the total reality, and that percentage is called the capacity factor. Wind has a very high capacity factor. And this site, like the sites on Maui and the sites in Kahuku as well, has a very high capacity factor. So you get a lot of bang for your buck. The other, the other factor is that your, this, this wind site is uh, just above the Kahi power plant where all the connections are. Exactly. So, so you don't have to build new connections all over the place. That's absolutely right. The, you know, coming out of Kahi is what we call our 138 uh, kV network. It's our high, high density network. And by connecting to that, <clears throat> we solve a number of problems. First of all, you don't have to build a long line to connect to somewhere else. And secondly, uh, the 138 system is a redundant system. In other words, there's at least two and sometimes three lines so that if one should happen to fail, and it could happen, or we have any kind of problem, the other one can step in. So that means that we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, we sometimes take one of those lines out of service to do maintenance, or sometimes there's a problem. Uh, and if, that, if this were not connected to that 138 kV system, we'd have to ask the wind farm to shut down because we can't take their energy because the, you know, the extension cord for anybody. is disconnected. That's not good for anybody. So by connecting it to the 138 kV line, we can, we'll, we can do it at a very low cost to anyone, whether it's paid for by them or by us, the customers. And we have the assurance that, uh, you know, that 24-hour, seven, you know, seven-day-a-week, 365-day-a-year 
production is always available to our system. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, uh, it's very good. It's a, you know, yeah. it's good. We, we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think it was a very good project, but this is one of the reasons that we think it's a good one. Good. So Nick, uh, you know, can you give us the, the four corners of this project? I recall, I could be wrong, that's 48.5 megawatts. Am I right about that? I it believe it's about 47 megawatts, and it kind of depends on the, the, the final configuration of the turbines themselves. But it's 13 turbines that are 3.6 uh, megawatt machines. Okay. So that's, it's, it's about 47 megawatts, give or take. Okay, so give, um, us, give us the dimensions here, the specs, if you will. Yeah, sure. And just to, to go back um, to some of the things uh, you know you referenced, and also Peter talked about, you know, Eurus has been was attracted to the Hawaiian energy market and its commitment to renewable energy for for some time. In fact, we started looking um, at investments uh, in the state back in 2014, I believe it was, um, and just because of the way that things shook out as far as um, what what Hiko was looking for at the time, we made a lot more progress early on on a, a, a PV, a solar project that um, was, was built and that we own and operate uh, in on the west side of Oahu, near near the proposed wind side as well, but it's over in Waianae. So for the first uh, kind of phase of our, of our efforts in the state, we were really focused on bringing that project uh, to completion. And then as that project kind of wrapped up and operations began, we really started taking a closer look at um, the, the site that we refer to now as, as, as Palihua. So as, um, as Peter had mentioned, ECO recognized the value of the site. We went through a process uh, kind of identifying that there aren't really a lot of other sites on, on, uh, on the island that would be viable from a, from a standpoint of providing energy um, from wind. And uh, that's at the end of last year, we came to an agreement on the uh, on the power purchase agreement, and we were kind of off to the to the races. So that's kind of where we are now, as far as the project itself, um, kind of the specifics. Like I mentioned, it's, it's 13 turbines. Uh, it's anticipated to be 3.6 megawatt machines. So the the actual model themselves are going to be. Uh, uh, by a manufacturer known as Vestas. So Vestas is one of the, the European-based companies, one of the, the largest, um, depending on the year, it's either the number one manufacturer or the number two manufacturer of turbines worldwide. The turbines themselves are about um, 250 feet from the, the base, so the, the ground to the, to the hub, which is kind of the, the middle of the nacelle. Um, and then if you kind of anticipate the entire height or, of, of the turbine being the maximum blade tip, if it's kind of if the blade, one of the blades is sticking straight up in the air, so to speak, they're a little bit under 500 feet. So um, they've got a 136 meter rotor diameter. So the, the entire um, uh, swept area is uh, has a diameter of 136 meters. These are absolutely the kind of the newest and greatest and most efficient turbines out there. Have, uh, have they have all the, the sort of features that you would uh, imagine for kind of the highest, uh, the most advanced technology available anywhere in the world. So we're excited about um, what these turbines allow us to do at the site. They're, they're, they're far more efficient than some of the earlier iterations, uh, or more configurations of, of, of wind projects conceived for the site. So what that's allowed us to do is really get more, more energy uh, more megawatt hours out of the site by using far less machines. So that's that's always a positive. Mm -hmm. As far as the actual energy being generated that ECO would be buying under the, the PPA, our expectation is about 150,000 megawatt hours of electricity would be generated on an annual basis at the site. So How many homes for, with that service? Yeah, so I was just going to get to that. So that's from our from our calculations, it's about 25,000 the average of Waku homes use, so that'll power a fair amount of uh, of energy for the uh, for for the island, and um, we'll be selling that under a fixed price contract to Eco for for 22 years. So Eco's got kind of a guaranteed source uh, of clean energy at a fixed price that it can uh, provide to its customers. So that's kind of the I guess the four corners. I'm happy to talk about other specifics or. or well, let's it's first look at your slides. We have three slides. Uh, so okay. why don't you put the first one up? Okay, this is a map here. Uh, can you describe the map, Nick? 
Sure, and I, I, I'm assuming it's the one that shows the location of the project because I'm not actually look, looking at the, uh, the slides myself. Yeah, but, it's, got, it's got a so, green, a green uh, v, line on it. Green it looks like a there. V arrow sign. Yeah. Got it. So, so two. Um, this, two, yeah. this is the general location of the site. Uh, as you, you know, as you can imagine, with with wind projects, you, you want to put the turbines where it's windy, and in most cases, that's uh, on areas that are, you know, kind of. Um, Elevated or, or on ridge lines. So, as as Peter mentioned, uh, if you if you're familiar with the area behind the Kahe power plant, there's kind of a general mountain sloping um, upwards towards. I would say it's the northeast, and that land kind of flattens off to some degree as you as you go up the up the slope. So we'll have 13 turbines kind of generally situated up there um, at, on the on the mountain kind of above the the Kahe power plant or above the uh, yeah, the landfill area. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about the next slide? Oh, this is a, this is, what is this, a timeline chart? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have this one handy, Nick? Can you describe it to us? Yeah, 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 I'm familiar with that. So um, this is this is a slide that I think goes um, into some, some detail of showing kind of where we are in the, you know, what I would refer to as the development cycle, the process. So, you know, we... We first, when, when we first started, when we first started talking to Hiko um, about the project, it was, gosh, um, 2018, and we we agreed on the the terms of the PBA power purchase agreement kind of late last year. Uh, and so where we are right now is, I would say, in the the early stages of the the comprehensive studies that need to go on to actually get the project ready for construction, permitted, and, and ultimately built. So. I think the important point of this slide is that um, this is a this is a, a true multi-year process, and we're the process. And the point of that process right now, we're we really are kind of down in the weeds, doing the analysis and the studies on site, looking at the environmental, biological issues, cultural concerns, and all that to really get the project, you know, in a in a, in a form that it can be it can be permitted and built. So the other point here, I think that people people you raise with us is, you know, how are we going to have the public going to be able to have an I have insight or um, an ability to comment during the, the permit process? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And so, as you can see from from that slide, there's kind of multiple steps throughout throughout the cycle in which um, there'll be public engagement and the ability for public comment on specific aspects of the project. Yeah, that's the way it works in Hawaii for sure. Uh, any more slide? We got one more slide. Ah, ah, this is my favorite picture for sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? Is a picture so, of a windmill now, of a wind, turbine. Wind turbine. So that so it should be the uh, the actual. Uh, we got that from the manufacturer of the turbine Vestas themselves. So that's that is should be the Vestas V one thirty six. So this is the uh, the specific turbine model that will be utilized at the site. So again. Um, it's the best in class. It does really, really well um, in the environment that we're anticipating it to be placed in, and we're excited to be uh, installing them at the site. Beautiful. So, uh, uh, what about it, Mitch? What What are your thoughts so far? So, oh, um, what's the status of? Uh, do you have to uh, do an EA, uh, Nick, and then uh, full EIS, or has that already been done? And you're just like forging along your development path. What's the What's the status of so, that? Right now, I, as I, as I, if you go want to go back to the, the slide that kind of shows the timeline, we haven't done um, an actual EA or an EIS yet. A lot of that will get determined as a result of the study. So once we start getting the, you know, the data back from the studies about you know, what, what level of um, uh, biological concern there is or not, we would be able to kind of make the determination. So I'd say we're we're a bit, we're a ways out from making that determination. Of course, we'll do everything that we're required to do under, uh, under the law and under, you know, the, the permitting regime. But sure. we don't, I don't have this, I don't have the results of the studies yet because, frankly, the studies are actually still ongoing. And with a lot of these studies, it's not obviously a one-time thing where you go out and kind of look around and, and take stock of what's, what's, you know, out at the site at that period of time. You know, we have uh, biologists engaged and they're out there on a regular basis doing seasonal studies that you know you really have to take account of what's happening over a seasonal period or yeah. even uh, over a multi-year period so once we have those that the data sets that are generated from those studies we'll we'll be able to make a better determination
explanation of what process we can go through. So when I was looking at the aerial photograph of the, of the site, I didn't see uh, any major uh, uh, subdivisions or houses around the area. You look like you're kind of tucked away up on the top of the mountain and, the, and everybody else is down at the you know, ground level. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a fair that's that's a fair perspective on it. I mean, there isn't there aren't really um, we 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 purposely don't cite turbines um, for a variety of reasons near areas in which people live. That's not generally a, a prudent way to, to do this. Um, and the the areas in which we're anticipating putting the facilities aren't aren't near any any you know residences or or any areas like that. Well, um, we're going to take a short break, you okay. guys. But before we do, I just want to make a personal statement. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. You know, like a point of personal preference kind of thing. It's your show. You know, when I first saw the first wind project in, in southwest Mo of Maui, you know the project? I forget yeah. the name. It's the, the mountain up there. Right. I was taken by it. I loved it. I saw it as a harmony with nature. Right. I saw it as, as a, you know, as aesthetically beautiful. Right. And I, I saw it as the sound of it was, was uh, a special sound. And it touched me. It, it touched me as a, a complete aesthetic experience. And ever since then, I, I must say that I love wind. Not, you know, I'm not saying I don't like solar, but wind is, is dynamic. It's kinetic. Alive. You can feel it. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a kite flyer. So oh, no, I, know, yeah. I know about yeah. wind and kites, and I know about yeah. the vibrations you get on the lines to the kites. And it's that kinetic experience that it, it's a Zen, Zen thing. So uh, I'm, I kind of, I really like wind. I, I want to say that before the break. I got it off my chest. Now we're going to take a break. Okay. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Jane Sugimura, host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. I'm so, I'm so glad I got a chance to express that to you guys. I really needed to do that. Yeah, well, we, we, we appreciate the zen of your comments. Uh, for us, you know, it's just the main thing is when we compare solar to wind is wind is going 24-7. And uh, it's not just during the day. You can add a battery to a solar installation and you can use that electricity another time of day. But that adds a certain expense and certain, you know, if the sun doesn't shine that day, you can't fill your battery. So, uh, but the wind is going pretty much, especially in a, a place like that, which is very windy. And, and to, to Mitch's comment, there aren't any houses up there because nobody wants to live in a wind, <laughs> in a, you know, in the middle of a wind path. The like truth that. is that these wind farms, wherever they are, are always in spectacular locations. Well, they're if, very. If you, they, if you like them, they're very majestic looking. There's majestic no question. The they're they they look like giant. Uh, birds on the on the horizon they're like swans with a long neck I mean but you know that doesn't if you have to look at them all the time your opinion could change that's no, all no, I'm no, I tell you and I see it as more than just the kinetic energy thing it's a statement it's a statement this community this country whatever it is uh, understands about renewables mm -hmm. understands about climate change understands how we have to uh, you know, make our community adopt this kind of technology, this kind of energy. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a grand statement for that neighborhood, for that community, okay. in my view. One, one thing I just wanted to, to jump in on, too, when we were talking about, is obviously, you know, we're a big proponent of, of solar energy as well. We, we, we own the, the project in Waianae. We feel like it plays a very important role in, in Oahu's energy mix as well. But one, aside from the fact that, 
you know, as a wind project, we do generate during periods of time. Actually, a, a fair amount of our energy is actually generated when solar energy isn't available at, at nighttime. Um, the other, the other point, and when, when we were talking, I think it was last last time we spoke was was in December of last year. You had um, Tony Gill, who's from the family that owns the property. On, you know, they have a very um, defined goal of, of rehabilitating. The, the the land that that, that the project's going to be located on. Well, um, they're very the environmental. Is, that family, and very altruistic it, too. It, it, exactly, and the reason why I mention that is one of one challenge or limitation with with solar projects is you really do have to take it. They do take up a fair amount of of, of space. Uh, so putting putting solar up at the site up there, would, even if it was feasible, would would be problematic from a rehabilitation standpoint because they wouldn't be able to actually rehabilitate the, the land to the same degree. With the wind project, you know, you've got these towers that have a very very small base, and you can you can uh, run cattle, you can grow crops, pretty much right up to the to the base. So it really is uh, complementary, not only from a an energy mix and a diversity, but for the long-term goals of the family, rehabilitating the land up there, it, it really kind of it, it does it does a lot to, to, to address both those issues. Well, Peter, can you talk about where this fits in, in a diverse uh, array and sure. portfolio? Uh, as we were discussing, the diversity is very important. We've been dependent on oil and a little bit of coal for 100 years, and that's gotten us where we are, Which, uh, but it's no longer feasible. So we're getting more and more solar. As you know, we have about seven or eight projects that were approved uh, late last year. Uh, we'll be shortly going out. Uh, we're talking to the PUC right now. We'll shortly be going out for what we call phase two. Uh, likely that'll be a lot more solar projects. Uh, so <clears throat> the solar, you know, Hawaii leads the, the nation in solar, both uh, when you combine uh, the solar projects like the Eurus project that we call a grid scale projects with the rooftop solar or we're way ahead of anybody else, we're, we're, we're doing quite well on solar. But in terms of diversity, we have the two wind farms on this island, there are two on Maui, there are two on, on Hawaii Island. Uh, but we, we can, this adds to that, to that picture. And then we'll go out, as I said, in a few months, uh, within a couple of months, I think, to ask for more projects. And in all likelihood, we'll get back mostly solar uh, and solar with, with, with batteries. So uh, this helps to keep the, the, the projects diverse and keeps our, uh, you know, from having all, one, one, all of our eggs in one basket, gives us some variety because as we've now several times this is going 24 7. Hawaii is an evening peaking state you know we don't have a lot of manufacturing we need the power in the evening five o'clock to nine o'clock solar doesn't help and batteries can only do so much they're great so having a significant wind input to a system is absolutely essential or you act, end up having to fall back on on other things so uh, as we move forward toward our our next you know milestones we are going to get all the solar we can, but the wind is very important for that diversity of technology. And um, the, the location, as we discussed as well, is very good for uh, a lot in a lot of respects. It's close to power lines that exist. It's right near our Kahi power plant. Uh, it is in an area without a lot of residences uh, nearby. It'll certainly be visible, but I got to give Eurus a lot of credit. They were talking to the community. The community was uh, understand, understandably concerned about the visual effects. And so the Eurus redesign began to redesign the uh, location of some of the turbines. So they're set back a little bit from the very rim of, of, the, uh, of the back of the valley there. And it'll, you know, I'm not, nobody's saying it'll be invisible because it won't. Uh, but it will be less obtrusive, I think, than it would have been mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So Eurus has been out with the community. Uh, it's not a one-time deal. It's an ongoing deal. You never can, you can never do enough community outreach. You know, you talk to 10 people and five groups and the 11th person says, well, I never heard about it till now and I'm, I'm unhappy. So you can, it's an ongoing process, but I got to say Eurus has listened. They have a lot of experience in the community from their solar uh, installation, which is right on the ground and right in neighbor, you know, with a lot of neighbors. They know the people, uh, uh, a lot of the people in that area. So uh, it, it's a process, as we've seen, and it's ongoing. There's the permitting side, but the community outreach side is ongoing as well. Mm -hmm. And people will have chances to say, you know, I really am bothered by this. And 
It's in Eurus's interest, and it's in our interest. If if that can be fixed, we're going to try to going to try to fix it. Uh, it's not a matter of trying to stop the project. It's a matter of trying to get it right. And you get it right by listening to the people who are going to be living next to it. A lot of factors play into you know public opinion on this kind of thing, and one of them, you know, is uh, is uh, climate change. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, and that would have you know, for example, if we had an extreme weather here. Uh, what do you mean if? if? Except, thank you. If we had a, a notable uh, increase in sea level and all that, that is going to affect public opinion. And it's going to affect this whole mix of opinion right. that go around these issues. And five or ten years ago, people were beginning to get it. Now we're getting storms. We're going to have a nine, may have a nine hurricane season coming up. Uh, we've seen what Olivia and Lane did, not so much to this island, but to the big island, took a terrible beating. I don't think there's any you know, question about extreme weather is already here. There's flooding in Waikiki. There is there is uh, king, king, uh, sir, king tides, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's not an if, it's a since, because we're already feeling it, and it's only going to get worse. It is. And so, it's going to be on everybody's mind every No, I think you're absolutely right. And it wasn't on everybody's mind five years ago, certainly not 15 years ago. It was very, very theoretical. Uh, still, people who are think of it as theoretical, but I think anybody that reads the the, the newspaper, watches television news, or, or watches Think Tech. Or <laughs> well, I just assume they watch Think Tech. I didn't. Yeah. But uh, you know, they they realize that this is something, and we can't you know we can't lie still. And I've always said, you know, we're not uh, the amount of of greenhouse gas we emit from this island is minuscule in the worldwide situation. But on the other hand, you can't ask other countries to cut back when you're not doing everything you can yourself. And it's a better feeling when you are doing what you can. Absolutely. Mitch, you had something? I just had one uh, final thing for Nick. You know, uh, as you go through this process, I mean, we are part of the Energy Policy Forum, uh, which is uh, sponsoring this show. So, you know, in your, as you're wrapping up or as you're going along, if you can uh, spot or identify any policies that might help um, improve the process, uh, not beat the system, mind you, but just make the system better. Uh, we'd love to hear about it so that uh, you know, we can inject that in the system, maybe make it uh, more streamlined for people that follow you as you have your lessons learned going through here. You know, like share them with us so that uh, we can spread that word out there as well. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I commit to doing that. And I, I will say that you know, the, we were attracted to the Hawaiian market uh, for a large, to a large degree because of the leadership of Governor Ige and the you know the the leading the 100% renewable mandate that Hawaii passed prior to any other state in the United States. I mean, California uh, kind of followed Hawaii in that regard. So the leadership that Hawaii has shown uh, on the policy front is a big reason why is 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 really the reason why we're here. So as far as uh, what kind of more micro policies, it's definitely something that. Um, you know, we can always, you know, use the support of policymakers, and yeah, I commit to, to keeping keeping my my uh, my mind open to to policies that could help uh, facilitate this kind of development in the future. Well, every every project can yield policies. Yeah. Uh, we have to live and learn on everything. Always looking for best practices and the like. I like to make a, one of my statements, if you don't mind, you guys. <laughs> You know, is there any way we can stop you? Uh, no. <laughs> no. He holds the camera. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, Nick was talking before about the, the new technology involved, um, you know, in these turbines. Yeah. And I don't think people realize, I think people have a very primitive view of what a turbine is mm -hmm. and how wind works. They, it's something out of Don Quixote, if you will. Sure, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or ancient Amsterdam, perhaps. Yeah. But the fact is that, you know, since we've been covering this, since the what the odd years, I like to say. Um, you know, the technology in solar has, has gone light years ahead, and so has the technology in wind. Absolutely. And people have to appreciate that the wind turbines of today are way different than they were five or 10 years ago. I'll tell you, if you're in Holland and you're standing there in front of a, an old windmill that was used to grind, you know, that, that was turning a wheel to grind uh, grain, and in the background you see a row of these what I think are beautiful 
uh, modern wind turbines, you are struck by, uh, you know, wind is not new, but it's come a long way in a relatively short period of time. Hawaii played a big role in that because we had, up in Kahuku, we had some of the original, uh, you know, models that were being tried out, and then some of them looked like egg beaters, and <laughs> some of them, you know, one, do you have, how many, how many uh, turbines do you have, and uh, how many uh, wingspans do you have on it? It's come a long way, and, and we're glad that Eurus is committed to getting the newest and the best. Don't you guys have like one of the old blades in front of your building? We have one, yeah. We, we had yeah. to take it down from the building. We have it inside now. So <laughs> we go over and we run our hand across it every so often as they... So let's, so let's let you make the last statement, Nick. What would you like to leave with the people? So uh, I'd just like to say that, you know, we view ourselves as a, a long-term partner with ECO. We've, we've really appreciated their desire to help support the project. and. We have a long-term commitment to the state of Hawaii and, and Oahu and look forward to working with the local community to make sure that this project happens in a way that is the most appropriate for, for all parties involved. Okay, Mitch, you get to close. You're the co-host, right? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the show. Nick, thank you so much for coming to us over the waves by the magic of uh, uh, electronics today. And I Thank we'll, you. we'll sign off and see you before we know it. It'll be Wednesday again next week. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So Thank you, Nick. Aloha. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks. Aloha. Thank you. Bye-bye. Always great to be here.